My name is Lucy Nathanson, I'm a child therapist um, and I work with children with selective mutism. I was actually here at this conference a year ago so I'm very happy to be back here today in Katowice so thank you for having me. So last year I discussed techniques that can be used to help children with selective mutism and today I'm going to take this a step further and I'm going to discuss how I've applied these techniques and I'll give an overview of some case studies of children that I've worked with so you can see how I've um, actually applied some of these techniques with children that I've worked with. Um, these case studies will hopefully give you an idea of um, how to implement a small steps plan with maybe a child you're working with or with your own child. So hopefully you'll get some ideas from these case studies. So the schedule for today is I thought it would be useful to start with an introduction to selective mutism. I know we're all familiar with selective mutism, but I thought it would still be useful to start with an introduction. So we'll be starting with what selective mutism is and how do we treat selective mutism. Following this, I'm going to cover five case studies of children that I've worked with. Okay, so starting with what is selective mutism? As we know, selective mutism is an anxiety disorder whereby the person wants to speak, but they can't in some situations. And they, they can speak in some situations, but they can't in others. Um, it's been described as a phobia of talking. So if we think of any phobia, so for example, if somebody has a phobia of spiders, um, when they're exposed to their phobia, the, the fight or f they experience a fight or flight response. So they, they might start sweating, their heart rate increases, um, and their muscles tense up. And children with selective mutism experience these same symptoms when they're in situations whereby there's an expectation for them to speak. So their heart, their, their, their muscles tense up and their throat muscles tense up to the extent that the words can't come out. Okay. Um, selective mutism is person and place dependent. So the child can talk to some people and not others, and they can talk in some places and not others. And most commonly, children can talk at home, and the parents often describe them as very confident and very loud and talkative at home. However, in other situations like school, where the anxiety is heightened, they, they are not able to speak. So they show very two different, um, different behaviours in situations where they're comfortable and situations where the anxiety is higher. Okay. So we've discussed this earlier, but selective mutism is not shyness. So children who are shy show very um, consistent behaviour. They're shy across settings. And also children who are shy talk after a warm-up period. Children with selective mutism, their behaviour is inconsistent. So in some situations, they're very talkative. And in other situations, they are the complete opposite. So their behaviour is very different. There's a marked difference um, in their behaviour depending on whether they are at ease or whether their anxiety is heightened. Also, children with selective mutism don't talk even after a warm-up period. So that is the key differences between children who are shy and children with selective mutism. Children with selective mutism want to speak, but they can't. And um, of course, every, everybody wants to talk to their friends, everybody wants to talk to their teacher. So it's not that they're choosing not to talk, they want to talk, but their anxiety is so high that they, they can't talk in these situations, despite wanting to. Some children are scared of people hearing their voices. Um, so if I'm working with a child with selective mutism and they're able to talk to me, um, they may be very hypervigilant, very aware of who can overhear them. So that, that they'll be looking around and if somebody um, walks past or is in earshot, they, they often stop talking. So they're very aware of who can hear at any point. 
Um, but this isn't the case for all children. Some of the younger children that I work with um, are happy to talk to me when other people are in earshot, but they're unable to talk directly to those, um, those other people. Um, so, so some children are scared of people overhearing them and some people are less hypervigilant in this way. But every child with selective mutism is different. Um, I've never come across two children that are exactly the same. So some children can talk freely at home but can't talk at school at all. Some children can talk to their teacher but can't talk to their peers. Some children can talk to their peers but not to their teacher. Some can talk to just girls and not boys or vice versa. Um, some children can't talk to their grandparents or um, extended family. So every child has a, a different presentation of selective mutism. And when um, developing a small sets plan, it's, it's really important to... Um, Get, get a real understanding of that specific child and um, in order to create the small sets plan. Um, and I'll give you some examples of these in a minute. Another point I'd like to add is that we, children don't just grow out of selective mutism. So um, it's really important that a small sets plan is put in place um, so that we can gradually help to guide the child in starting to face their fear of talking in small systematic steps. Um, in some cases it may have appeared as though a child has overcome selective mutism but this is you this is the case when the people around them have naturally done all the right things. So maybe there's a very um, intuitive teacher who has just um, you know just naturally known how to how to do the right things and how to put a small steps plan in place without there being, without there formally being one. And in these cases, it may appear as though the child has overcome selective mutism or just grown out of it. But we can't rely on this happening naturally and that's why it's so important that it needs to be a careful plan uh, put in place. Okay, so how do we treat selective mutism? As we know, it's a small steps plan guiding the child in facing their fear of talking in small steps. And everyone has their part to play. Parents, key, the key worker, and the teacher. And I found that interventions um, are most effective when these adults work very closely and collaboratively together to support the child. The more collaboration that there is, the quicker the child starts to make progress. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss case studies of intervention programs um, that I've worked with. So there are different approaches to working with children with selective mutism, um, and I'm going to share some of the interventions that have worked with the children that I've worked with. Of course, I was actively involved in all of the interventions that I'm about to discuss, but I'm hoping that you will still get some ideas for children that you're working with or your own child from these examples. So generally, my work with children falls into one of three categories. The first type of inter intervention is weekly sessions with myself in school. So I'll go in every Wednesday morning, for example, and work with a child on a weekly basis. The second way I work with a child is I don't go in weekly, but a school-based key worker, for example, the teaching assistant, will be delivering the program with my guidance. So I will discuss um, some case studies of, of this with this example. And the final um, category is our individual inten intensives. So these are a succession of daily sessions with myself. So I'll work with a child, for example, for a week, um, either at school or at home, and I'll set up the programme. So I'll discuss two case studies like this. Okay, so starting with child one. So this child was six years old and before this intervention she um, at school she didn't talk to any adults and she spoke to just two friends in class so the other children didn't hear her voice and when I started working with her the other children said to me oh she, she doesn't talk. So it was very clear that she was silent in class. She spoke to two friends when she was out of earshot of the others. So my intervention started with a home session and I always start um, sessions with a child at home because as we know um, selective mutism is 
place and person dependent and the child is of course most comfortable at home. So I start at home um, and then I attended school once a week for two hours. The first goal in this small steps program was for the child to speak to me firstly at home and then to speak to me at school. Just because she's spoken to me at home doesn't mean that she will automatically speak to me at school because at school her anxiety levels are higher. Once she was speaking to me in both settings, at school we began to introduce children to the sessions. So that was the next step in the small steps program. She was talking to me at school and then I'd invite one child to our session. So we'd play a game and then one child will join in the game. So she started to speak to that child and I'd rotate the children. So then after that, we'd introduce another child to the game and we only ever played games that she was very comfortable with. So during each, during each two hour session I spent at school, I spent some of the time holding these very focused sliding in sessions with the target person. So for example, with a specific peer. And I spent the rest of the time in class um, with the child during her normal class activities. So if the class were doing some painting, I'd sit with her while she was painting. Um, and I'd be prompting for speech during these normal class activities. With the goal, um, um, the goal being for her voice to be heard more and more in class. Because we wanted to lose that label of she doesn't talk. So she started to speak to me in class. So once a, child, once a child was talking in front of and to children, we then held sessions with key adults at school. So the teaching assistant and the, and the teacher. So as you can see, this is a very systematic approach. The first goal was for her to talk to me. We then introduced children. And then once she's talking to all the children, we then introduce the adults. It's a very systematic approach. Each step is building on the last. I also mentored the staff on how to prompt the speech when I wasn't there because I was only at school once a week. So it was important that um, the, the staff knew how to prompt the speech and to, to continue the, pro, um, the progress when I wasn't there. And actually this consistency is so key to success. It's important that um, all, everybody is, is trained in, in what to do and to be doing it on a regular basis. Consistency is so important. So now um, this child is speaking to all adults and all children at school as well as unfamiliar adults at school now. So she's not actually showing any signs of selective mutism. So as you can see it's a very clear systematic approach in school. Okay, so child two. For this child, I didn't actually attend school for regular sessions like I did with the previous child. Um, I believe that parents and schools are able to in implement an intervention by themselves, but sometimes I find that teachers and key workers really want to help and they, re they, they can... They really um, want to help the child, but they just don't know how. So in these instances, I train the teacher and the key worker in what to do, and they do it, and then I just um, oversee the program, and we're in regular contact, and I give them advice and guidance. So with this child, we started off with one home session so that the child was talking to me at home. I could see what worked for that child, and I also um, had a detailed discussion with the parents um, regarding that child's specific um, talking behaviour, who they talk to, um, in what situations, to gain a real understanding of that specific child, because as we discussed, every child is different. I also had a um, detailed discussion with the school, because again, she, she shows very different behaviours at school, so we need to gain a real understanding of her, of her selective mutism at school. And following all this information, I then wrote a small steps plan for the school to follow. I trained the school in selective mutism and mentored the key worker in how to deliver the small steps program for that specific child. Um, and the key worker emailed me on a weekly basis and I offered um, advice and next steps. So I'm going to show you now a simplified version of a small steps plan so you can see 
Um, so you can see how you could perhaps make such a plan for your child or a child you're working with. So here's a, a simple version. So a, one of the goals for this specific child was for her to answer a question in front of the class. That was one of the goals. Now, she was able to use her voice in class with her key worker, but she wasn't able to speak in front of larger groups and she wasn't able to speak directly to some children. So the small step was for the key worker to ask a child a question um, at a table with one peer, um, in the presence of one peer. And each day we built on this, so the, the, we, we, we gradually increased the size of the group over time. So um, the, the step is so small that the child's anxiety level is kept at a minimum and they don't really even notice that they're, they're moving to the next step. That's the best way to implement a small steps program. We, we want to make it so subtle, they don't even really notice that, that we're moving on to another step. So each day we gradually increase the size of the group and um, over time, she was able to answer a question in front of the, the whole class. Another goal for this specific child was for her to speak to her music teacher. So she was unable to speak to this specific music teacher. And within the busy music class environment, um, it, was, it was very difficult for her. So again, um, we broke this down into a small step and the key worker facilitated some sliding in sessions with the music teacher away from music class. So they played games with the key worker, with the, with the music teacher gradually sliding in, um, and they established speech out of the music class and then gradually transferred this to the music class until she was able to speak to the music teacher in class. So as you can see, we're just breaking down each goal into small steps and consistency is the key. Another goal for this child was to engage in the morning handshake. So at this school, every morning, the, when the children came to school, they had to shake the hand of the teacher. And this child, um, when her anxiety was heightened, she became physically very stiff and she couldn't shake the hand of the teacher. So her body became stiff. So in this, exactly the same way, we broke this down into small steps. So the first step being the, removing the pressure about the handshake. So saying, don't worry, we don't have to do that, it's, it's okay. You know, taking away the pressure, not making a big deal out of it. And then the teacher just got down to her level and just touched her on the arm and just said, good morning, when she came to school. Then over the following days and weeks, she then started to move her hand closer to the, 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 to the child's hand. And she said, good morning. Until eventually the child was totally fine with this and only once she was totally fine with this, the teacher then put her hand under the child's hand and the child was able to lower her hand and give a handshake. So it's the same, same principle. So hopefully this, these examples give you an idea of um, how you could apply the same strategies um, to, to the children that you, that you know. Okay, moving on to child three. So he, this is a boy, age seven, and he has um, autism as well as selective mutism, so two diagnoses. And he didn't speak for four years in his previous school. So he didn't talk to um, children or adults, and he even found it hard to talk to his mum at school. So he had very strong associations um, with school being a non-talking environment. So we had to deliver a very carefully planned intervention. I didn't want his new school to also get the same association. So we started off with two we started off with two home sessions with myself, and the goal was for the child to talk to me at home, which he did. Um, and I was actually the first adult outside of the family that he had spoken to. After this, we brought the, the key worker from um, school to the home, and he started to speak to the key worker at home. And this was really important um, so that she wasn't associated with school. And also, it was an opportunity for me to train her in how to interact with him. 
So as you can see, it's a very systematic approach. First, you're talking to me at home, then the key worker at home, and then um, we had two, se um, and then the child had sessions with the key worker at school. So we then transferred the speech with the key worker from home to school. And he was able at this stage, because we had broken it down to these small steps, he was able to talk to her at school. Actually, the first adult he'd ever spoken to at school because it because the program was so carefully planned so this key worker emails me on a weekly basis and i give her advice give suggestions for the next step so because this key worker is with him um full time at school um she spends some time with him during the day um on a one-to-one -one basis having sessions with target people, for example, peers or um, specific teachers. And she also spends time with him in class, prompting him for speech in the normal class environment so that his voice is becoming more and more heard in class. And that's um, another, again, you can see that this is a very consistent approach. The child is, is, is having consistent sessions um, and, and they're getting, he's getting used to talking. Um, he's he's unlearnt the previous behaviour. He's not he hasn't associated the school now as being a non-talking environment because he's having these regular sessions, and that is so important. So this child now talks to peers in class um, when his key worker is present, and he is now answering the teacher through the key worker. So if the teacher asks him a question in front of the class, he looks at his key worker and gives the answer. Um, so that's fantastic. His voice is being used in the classroom regularly. So the next step is uh, that we're working on is for the key worker to start to slide out because we want to lose any dependence on the key worker being present. So she is now not so um, hands-on with him in class, but sitting next to him and even taking a few seats away from him, gradually starting to move further away and spending time out of the classroom as well. So as you can see, like the other case studies, it's a very systematic approach, where, um, identifying what is the next small step and ensuring that the sessions are consistent. Okay, so the next um, two case studies that I'm going to discuss with you are um, individual intensives. So this is a different way of working with a child, but it follows the exact, the exact same principle as the above three case studies. So it's also a small sets program, but I work with a child every day for a week, for example. So three to five days and at home or at school, depending on that specific child's um, selective mutism. We have extended session time. So usually I'd spend half a day with the child at home or at school every day for a week, for example. And of course, we tailor the program to the child's needs. Um, as we've discussed throughout, every child is different. So we identify that child's specific goals for the week. And we need to be realistic because, um, you know, we can't achieve everything in just one week. We need to identify specific goals and um, start to put these in place. And the, um, um, the great thing about these intensives is that the child builds momentum. Because we ha spend a day or half a day um, doing sessions, and then the next day we can build on that progress. And the next day we can build on it again. So this child starts to build momentum um, rather than the traditional approach whereby, you know, you, you have a session and, um, on a weekly basis. You know, there's a week gap in between. So um, whereas with this approach, we, each day we're building, building on the previous day's process. But at the same time, we're still moving in small steps. This is a child who I, I did a week intensive at school with. So prior to this, the child did not talk to any adults or children at school. She was only able to whisper to her mum if she was in a small room at school with the door closed. So she couldn't even talk to her mum in a normal voice at school. She could whisper to mum if the door was closed and they were in a small room. And she stopped whispering as soon as the teaching assistant entered the room. So the mum contacted me because she said she'd been doing the sliding in technique for five months at school without any progress. 
And in these instances, if there isn't progress, it's important to assess the situation and identify why there, there is no progress. What, what is going on here? And also identify possible maintaining factors that may be preventing progress. So we started off with two sessions at home with myself. So the child was talking freely to me at home and I could you know, talk to mum in detail about the child and um, assess you know, her talking habits. We then spent a week at school having sessions with both mum and the teaching assistant at school. And we identified why she was unable to continue whispering when the teaching assistant entered. And I saw that the, the room they were using was very small. So um, the child was in the room with the mum, she was whispering to mum, and as soon as the teaching assistant walked in the room, she was, the teaching assistant was immediately very close. And with a small set programme, it needs to be a very gradual approach. You know, the, the person needs to be sliding in very gradually. And the, the, because the room they were using was so small, the, ch the, the, the teaching assistant was not sliding in gradually. Um, so we moved to a bigger room and I also coached and trained the teaching assistant on the approach and how to be very subtle. And by the end of the week, the teaching assist the child was carrying and talking, first of all, in front of the teaching assistant, and she actually got to the stage where she was answering the teaching assistant's questions. So as you can see, um, progress can be quite fast as long as we you know, identify what is increasing that child's anxiety? Try to you know, understand the situation from the child's perspective and, there, and then change the situation, amend the environment. And once we do that, we can make progress. And also by the end of the week, the child was using her normal, her normal voice at school, so she was no longer whispering. Um, so, Throughout this week, I was training the mum in how to um, work with the child and also training the teaching assistant. So it's really important that they are um, equipped in how to continue the programme without me. So following this, mum has continued sessions without me and she has established speech with another teaching assistant by herself, which is fantastic. Um, so the intensive enable the process to start and the mum and the teaching assistant are now equipped to con continue sessions without me and I just go in um, you know every month or every six weeks just to oversee the program and ensure that we're all moving in the right direction we're continuing to move in the right direction so that is an example of a an intensive program at school but at as you can see, it's exactly the same principle, small steps program, um, and very consistent. The final child we're going to discuss today, um, child five, she was five years old, and this was an intensive at home. So a week, I spent a week with her at home, and she had never spoken to any child or adult outside of the immediate family. Um, she had a lot of fears she um so it wasn't just the fear of talking but um she had she didn't like to get her hair wet or her clothes wet um she um was afraid of going into the garden without her shoes on um so she had a lot of things that she was scared of so we started to target her fears progressively starting with the least scary and it became a game so we started with something she really didn't find scary at all. We did it. I gave her a lot of positive reinforcement. We reinforced all her brave behavior. And then we targeted the next thing. We tried to do the next thing on her list and so on. Um, so, so, so we started to build on these. I never, um, we only um, focus on the next step. So I never tell her, you know, if you do this, then tomorrow we'll be doing something else because that can really scare the child off. So we don't tell them the, the future steps. We only work at, um, one step at a time. And she enjoyed it because each step was manageable. It's really important that with any small steps program, each step is very manageable for the child. So the first few days we spent at home targeting these fears. And the next few days, we invited children and family friends over to deliver for, for them to um, 
have sessions at home with the child so she could start to use her voice with them at home. We also went out into the community, so to the park, the, the soft plate, the ice cream shop, for her to practice talking um, in, in, in real, normal, day-to-day -day situations. And also for mum to see how we prompt the child for speech in these situations and for me to observe the mum and to give her feedback as well. That is so important so that mum is um, equipped to continue the progress after I leave. And the great thing was that the child did build momentum. So um, she started to really enjoy the process. We were having fun and um, each day built on the previous. So there was not a, a gap in between sessions and we could build on progress. So the progress was faster. And by the end of the week, she had spoken to new adults and new children. And for the first time in her life, she had spoken outside of her immediate family. Um, so this case study demonstrates the importance of a systematic plan in place and the, and the importance of regular exposures. Mum has continued the exposures without me because she is very well trained and equipped in how to do this. Um, so so mum regularly takes her out um, you know, and practices um, prompting for speech in normal day-to-day -day situations at every opportunity. And I also delivered an intensive week with this child at school um, because she, she didn't speak at school either to anyone. And within that week, like child four, she began to talk to her teacher and her teaching assistant at school. So, um, so it was a very systematic and consistent approach. So why can intensives be beneficial? The, the last two case studies I described. So from my experience, children with selective mutism need time. And intensives provide very focused time. So we're spending this time really um, focusing on helping them to reach their goals in small steps. And this allows the process to start and for the child to start to make some real solid steps. Um, and the, these can then be built on after the week. But we must always move at the child's pace. Uh, we, we never ever push the child um, because this does more harm than good. Um, so we're always moving at the child's pace. Intensives can start the process as long as schools continue sessions after the intensives and also parents must continue the exposures in the real world after the program. So what's the secret to the above five case studies we've discussed? So parents and the school were trained in the techniques. Um, they knew what to do. Now, you know, it's, it's really important that everybody who's working with the child and implementing the program understands what to do because um, if, I, I've heard of many situations where um, psychologists or speech language therapists are implementing the program but, but not making any progress. So it's important that everyone is aware of what to do. So of course in these case studies, I trained the parents but and the school, but they could also self-teach by reading books on selective mutism, like the Selective Mutism Resource Manual or the Selective Mutism Treatment Guide. So there are um, books out there to, to, to educate professionals and parents. Also, I gave ongoing mentoring and guidance for both the school staff and the parents. So I was advising them on, on next steps and uh, reviewing the program regularly. So this is really important to ensure that we're continuing to make progress. And of course, all of the case studies I've discussed, um, the key, a key element was the, the, the approach was very consistent. So this is it's so important, as I've said a few times today, that um, the therapy is consistent. If, um, if you take away one thing from my presentation, it's that the child needs to have regular sessions um, so that they can start to make progress. And this can be built on. So in the above examples, I was working with the children. So in a way, my job was to hold the program together. But parents and schools can also get positive results and help the child to make you know, steps forward as long as there is a consistent and collaborative approach. Also, there was extended time dedicated to sessions. Um, if you spend extended time, the child can start to make progress um, and we can build on this. If the session is very short, then they, they, 
they haven't had enough time to feel comfortable and to start to make some solid steps forward. And lastly, um, each of these interventions was very carefully planned. So every microscopic detail is planned for. We predict how the child, this, that specific child will respond. Um, we, we plan for everything so that, um, so that we keep the anxiety to a minimum. We even plan how much eye contact we give the child. You know, when are they ready for more eye contact? Because, of course, every child is different and there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Each of the case studies I've described to you had a very different intervention and it's important that interventions are tailored to the child because every child is an individual after all. So I hope this presentation has given you an idea of how to implement a small steps program with your child or a child you're working with. Um, here are some more uh, references for your, some more resources for your information. So thank you for listening. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>